Pam and I left uh, Calvary Wesleyan Church after being there about seven years over in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania Avenue, just past the train track. Had a great uh, ministry. We learned a lot, but I had already pastored for a number of years, so hopefully we did a respectable job there too. So we had this ministry going there. Then we went out to the Midwest. We went out to the Midwest, we went to Olathe, Kansas. Nothing wrong with Olathe, Kansas, and the people there have told you a lot about that before. How we felt so out of place, it was a year that we really wish we wouldn't have had. I literally was so discouraged, and I went through a depression, and I hadn't really been through a depression like that, where I didn't even want to function any day that I was there. I was really wishing that God would strike me dead. And I even prayed that a few times, say, God, I wish you would. I haven't had that challenge hardly in my life, but I sure did then. I just was like, God, where are you? Have you forgotten us? What is up? We're in the wrong place and all this. Then our, our nephew, uh, cousin rather, four years old, got a bad transfusion to hospital. You know that, doctor's office actually. They gave him salt or sugar, whichever one they weren't supposed to give him. They gave him, killed him. Four years old, he just had the flu and then he got treated. Got, it just killed him. So I thought, well, I'm here for them. I'm here to comfort them because they've been coming to our church. And so we did the funeral. It was the hardest funeral. And uh, did the funeral service and all that. It was just, you're just sick. Um, but then I was thinking, God, they had other friends around here. There were other relatives around here that could have taken care of them. What in the world? And we left there and went on back over into Warrington, Missouri. Now, not to have a pity party and you don't need to play the violin for me and all that. I'm just sh sharing with you because it tees up the message where I'm headed. Um, I've asked God a few times, I said, God, it seemed like you've been with me my whole life, but I don't know where you were then. Kind of felt like that. I didn't know what you were doing then. I'm just being, I'm being transparent. I hope you can handle this. Being very transparent. I just like, I know you're always God. You're always with us. But boy, I sure had trouble. It was probably two years ago. I was asked to go to a meeting called Exponential. I fly to wherever I went to that one, I don't know, I went to several of them. So I don't remember what uh, state I was in, I could probably figure it out, but I forget what state I was in for this one. Went to this place, sat down, and they said, we're gonna break out into small groups now. And so I walk over into this group, there's a big bunch of people there, pastors mostly. I walk over to this group and I sit down where I'm supposed to sit. The guy looks over at me and he says, you're Kevin Federhoff. I said, yep. He said, you remember who I am? I looked at him for just a little bit and I thought, wow, you were a little kid. I used to know you back in Olathe, Kansas, one year. Wow, you remember me. I, I, now I do remember you. I do know your family. He said, you were a great inspiration to me. I saw how church could be. I didn't even know church could be like you conducted it as you were there. God called me into ministry. And I patterned my ministry a lot after what I saw you do. I'm sitting there thinking, good grief, you have got to be kidding. I said, how's your church doing? He said, oh, we run a thousand. God is really blessing us. He said, you really inspired my brother. He pastored a church before I did where I am now. I said, you got to be kidding. No, nope, but he's a DS out here in the West. I said, you got to be kidding. You inspired him too, he said. You don't know what God does in your seasons of I don't know what's going on. You don't have a clue. You don't have a clue what's going on when you think God isn't anywhere around you, like he has forgotten you, like he doesn't even know, like he is on some far off place and left you deserted wherever you are. You don't know. Last night, I watched a little bit of uh, the Billy Graham ministry. It was uh, his organization, they were talking a little bit about Samaritan Purse. And they said, yeah, we've gone into Ukraine. And then they take you on this video footage into Ukraine. And you know, we've been military, and I know there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes where they're lining a lot of people's pockets financially. I, I know all that. I don't even need, you don't need to remind me because I follow politics and I follow stuff. I know what that would represent. But I watched what the ministry was doing. And so out of politics, on to people. When I looked at what they were saying, they said, yeah, they said they've been bombing out these places, they showed them. They even had a, a missile raid while, while the show was being filmed. So you see the people running down into the basements, they're scared out of their head. And you see the Samaritan Purse people there, there are chaplains, there are pastors from the Ukraine they have worked with and trained. 
There are well drillers. There are people dispensing food. There are all kinds of people that are helping these people in this war-torn region. It's unbelievable. So they're drilling down these wells in the basement of churches because the Russians cut off their water supply into a main city of a half million people. It's crazy. Just straight away crazy. It's evil. And so this is happening. And while all of this is going on, they said, we're going we're gonna, to uh, talk to some people. So they, they get a guy over here and they say, what's happened? He said, well, you know what? I'm a minister from here. And they're having to interpret for him. But he says, this war has been terrible, but it's sending people back to church. There's so many people coming to church now. So many people uh, getting baptized. So many people listening to messages that didn't use to. They're coming to church. Then they go over and they put a microphone in somebody else's face. They say, what do you think of all this stuff? And you know what he said? He said, I want to know where God is. Where is God in all of this? This is crazy. Our lives are being shot at day after day. We don't know when a missile, a plane, a, a something's going to fly over. Where is God in all of this? And you today might be in your own Ukraine, your own Olathe, Kansas experience. You know, there's an age-old question that people ask and nobody has the answer to. If no one is in the forest when a tree falls, does it make a noise? Well, none of us know. But if you go into the forest after the tree has fallen, you can't fall in, you can count the rings on the tree. If I'm right, say yes. So you look at the rings, and if you could look at the rings of that tree and it could talk to you, those rings would tell you a story because every story has a ring and every ring has a story. The ring that you look at here says, wow, it was great, this was wonderful. We had enough soil that was right. We had enough water that was great. The air was right, the temperatures were right. This was a great year, we had enough of everything and it was great. Matter of fact, growing was abundant. It was so cool. Well, what happened over here on this ring? Well, a fire went through the forest and, 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 and it really worked over a lot of people, a lot of trees, a lot of things, all that, it was bad. Well, what happened over here? Well, a disease went through that year and that disease, when it went through, it took care of a lot of this, that, and the other. So every ring has a story. Every story has a ring. If we were to cut your heart open today, we could see the rings of your heart, your life. We would be able to hear the stories that you are able to tell. Some are beautiful. Some are maybe meh. Some are really challenging. And you're trying to tell them and you're living your life and you want to do right. If you look in Psalm 13, it appears that this would be a psalm where David is talking to us. He is writing this song when he is living a life in what would be called the unsolved mysteries of his life. Now, we have had pastors come through here and refer to the mystery bag, and that's the thing you put things in until you get to heaven, and you ask the Lord if you care. I've referred to that a number of times. I'll just call this message today the unsolved mysteries. We're in a message series on free to fly. And when we're free to fly, that means we lock into something and say, Lord, I am living the way you want me to live. I don't understand what's going on. But whatever's going on, I choose to follow you. I will not turn from you. I am going to go through with you and believe that your scripture's right, even when I don't feel that you're with me, even when I don't feel like it, even whenever I'm not sure of everything that's happening around me, I'm still gonna put my faith in you. Now, I've watched a number of people do that uh, my whole life, and I realize there's something to it. After I've lived this long, I see it, and so in this message series, I decided to tackle this as one of the bigger messages that I would be looking at in this message series. David is chased by King Saul. He knows what it is to be chased by him. He knows what it is to be chased by his son and be ousted as king by his son for a temporary time. He knows what it is to have all kinds of things happen when he could get revenge, but he doesn't level revenge. He doesn't exact the thing that all the rest of us might think he should. Yet he puts his pithy little psalm in here, just six verses long. It seems like a real quick one, a real short one, but it's so full, it's so packed as he navigates through three twists in his situation to show us how to finally come to peace with our unsolved mysteries of life. We'll walk with him. Twist number one, David's predicament, one through three. Look at it. He felt he was abandoned. He felt he was abandoned by God. Look at verse one. It looks like a, maybe a momentary lapse of memory. God, have you forgotten me? This is kind of what he is saying in this. Then he's kind of wondering, wait a minute. Maybe this is some kind of an endless abandonment. Maybe it's a permanent situation where God just kind of flicked me off the island. Look, he says, have you forsaken me? I don't know. what. Look how he says it in verse 1. Have you forgotten me? Have you hidden your face from me? In other words, you're not even looking my way. Notice in those first of first opening words four times he says how long how long how long how long 
He asked it four times. How long? He's asking God. Legitimate question and not ashamed to ask. David is feeling the minor keys of life. He's feeling the doldrums of it all. Verse 2, look at it. He feels like he is flooded with dead-end emotions. He said, I have sorrow daily, as if the same stuff is repeating every day. Will this ever end? What's going on with this? Verse 3, he says he's overwhelmed with this whole thing. Look at me, Lord, as if the Lord was looking at somebody else or something else. He said, look at me, Lord. Hey, look at me. It reminded me when Lily came over, two or three years old. She, she looked at me and she's, hey, will you play with me? And, and so I think, hey, here's a little screen. You can watch this little screen. And she looked over at me and grabbed my face, said, I want to look at you. She didn't want to screen, and David is saying, I want to look at you, God. Look at me. Look at me. See me too. I'm not invisible. And notice what he says here. He gives a Hebrew idiom that we wouldn't maybe use, but give light to my eyes. It indicates health. His health is stressed out. He's broken down. He's feeling the, all the pressure of this. Verse 3, look at it. Give me a ray of hope, or I will be dead. Loved one walks out on you, loss of job, loss of health, the list goes on. You say, Kev, nobody, nobody here today needs this message. Well, maybe you don't. I hope you don't. I hope you don't ever need this message, but the sure fact is someday you will. I'm almost 100% sure. I walked in this morning, at, entering down at the connector, headed over to my office to grab my Bible and, and to bring my sermon along and come over. And when I went in, I saw, I saw someone and I said, hey, uh, real quick, how's your nephew? Nephew in the 30s has several kids diagnosed with, with very, very serious cancer situation. And he said very quickly, said, well, the medicine that they were giving was working. It was supposed to work for seven years at least, but three months in, it stopped working. And now the tumors have started to grow again. And uh, I said, well, we're going to pray a prayer of faith. They said they've given him a new medicine. They believe it'll work. We're going to pray a prayer of faith that it will work. Right now, let's pray. And we agreed together and we prayed a prayer of faith that it would work. But he said, he's really, he's really asking God, where are you? God, where are you? Where are you? Laura Marie Kirk is a friend of our family, but became a friend through my daughter Andrea. They're friends. Laura Marie's in her 30s. Her picture's on the screen. You see it there. They have two children there. They have one more that's uh, uh, under a year. And being under a year, uh, making three kids, whew, that's enough to fill your plate right there. Can I get a witness somewhere in the house? Oh, yes, I got a soft, polite laugh. That was the best I could get, but everybody knows it's the truth. Everybody knows that if you have kids. You know that's the truth. But she was recently diagnosed with acute, uh, acute um, um, what is it, lymphoma. Um, it, it, no, it was a skin cancer thing with them. Yeah, that. So anyway, melanoma. She was diagnosed with that at stage three or four. It's pretty, pretty bad. So Laura Marie, if you're watching today, our prayers are with you. She wrote this, Pam read it to me the other day and I thought, oh shoot, we asked permission, so today I share it with Laura Marie's permission to you. Some days are hard, today was hard. Six hours of appointment, 100% hard. The kind of hard where you get a text message at your 12 month old has a 105.1 fever in the middle of your cancer discussion with your doctor. Where she learns she's got eyes that say you're pre-MS so you can't have some treatments. Huh. I was in survival mode three hours later and two appointments later, I was angry. Then in Chick-fil-A, after not eating all day, I cried. So today is a sad day. I cried, I cussed. Then I cried, prayed, cried, prayed, cried, and cried. It feels like too much. We'll go back to that in a little bit if I remember. Let's continue on with David to his second twist. The second twist after he cites his predicament is verse two through four, David's prayer. Notice verse three. 
David looks to God to restore him. He says, look on me. Don't look the other way. Look on me. Everybody else may be giving up. The prayer chain may have broken. God, my family may not understand. God, nobody understand. The doctor, the nurse, nobody understand. My employer, nobody. God, he said, look, look at me. Don't look the other way. He asked God to deal with his enemies. Why did he ask him to do that? Look at verse two of your passage. You'll understand it perhaps better. He begins to say they're gloating in this situation right here. They're shaping the discussion. They're, they're texting things. They're putting things on Facebook. They're, they're shaping the conversations at the water cooler. They are, they are gloating about my pain and my discomfort. Look at verse four of our passage here. My enemy will say, I have overcome him. Ha, 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 you can hear. Sometimes the odds seem stacked against us, don't they? Seems like it. Dennis Quaid starred in a movie on a wing and a prayer. The real person in 2009 was Doug White, his wife and their two kids. They took off on a flight, the pilot and them on a small plane. Somewhere mid-flight, the pilot died. Massive heart attack. Doug did not know how to fly a plane, but now his family is up in the air. You've got to do something. You've got to do your best. What are you going to do with that? He pulls a pilot out of the pilot's spot, lays him in the floor. He and his wife jump into the pilot, co-pilot spot. The movie gets very intense. I'm sure it was even more intense in real life. They're in this plane. They're radioing, but they're not real smooth or good with it. They're radioing, and then they're going in and out of signals. They would see an airport, but didn't really know what to do. They couldn't get the instructions right. Finally, there is somebody who learns of their plight. He's not at any, radio, at any airport, but he is at home. He knows what that plane looks like, so he sets up a mock plane in front of himself, just a homemade thing, a box here, a, a, a dial there, a thing here. He just sets it up quickly and gets on his phone and he calls them up as he got the number. And he says, you can't see me. You must trust me. He says, I want you to do this now. They did this. I want you to do this. They did that. I want you to do that. Do you see an airport ahead of you? Yes, we see an airport. Do you see a runway in front of you? Yes. He got clearance from the airport that they could land. He says, now we're going to take this plane in for a landing. Oh my stars. Could you imagine being there? Never flown a plane. Never landed a plane. Now it's your turn. Landing a plane. Not familiar. Here we are. He says, push this way and turn this knob that way. Do the other thing this way. He says, I want you, I want you to listen and do everything I tell you to do. They're listening to the person they have never seen with a voice that is faint on the phone. They're coming down toward the runway. As they come down in the plane, closer and closer, they're either gonna experience a wreck, carnage, and probably death, or they're gonna somehow land it, albeit bumpy, and safely get where they want to go. He gets them down to where they're just above the runway, and he says, let off everything. Let off everything. Let off everything. Let off everything. And the plane hits and bounces and sideways this and that. And pretty soon it comes to a stop on the runway. I watched that and I said, oh man. That's like navigating life with God. Sometimes. Sometimes. He says, let go and know that I am God. <laughs> I'm bigger than you. I know more than you. I've been where you haven't been. I know how to go where you want to go. I know how to get you where I need you to be. I know what has happened around you, the people that have died around you, the plane flying where you don't know how to take it. I know the way. I know the way all the way home. And in those moments, we have to let go, and we have to let God take over. You can't see me but you need to trust me. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what we need to do with our God. We can't always see him, but through his word and through the word, through the Holy Spirit speaking into us, we are able to do all things through him who gives us the strength. David was in a predicament and then David had a prayer, but I notice this, David had praise. Look at verse five and six. 
He sang in verse five, David sang of God's salvation. He sang because he believed somewhere, somehow, God was still God. And even though he didn't have the warm fuzzies, he knew that God would somehow, someway, be around him. His enemies are insulting him. God's quietness seems to be deafening to him, but David felt like God existed nonetheless. He had faith, if you will, the size of the grain of mustard seed, which the Bible says is all that we need to move mountains. And in those moments, he called on the mustard seed of his faith. And he said, hey, you may not be much, but you're all I've got. And so he says, we're gonna trust this God to some way see us through what we can't see us through. And in verse six of the passage here, David saying of God's sufficiency. He said, God, you have been there in the ages past. You were there for Abraham when he went into a land he didn't know where he was going. You were there when Moses stood before Pharaoh and couldn't talk without stammering. You were there when they were hemmed in by the Red Sea before and Pharaoh's army behind. You were there when they were in the desert and they needed a fire to warm them and they needed a light and a cloud. God, you were there with them. God, you've been there. You can hear his mind racing through all of the things that he has seen. You have been there for me, he would say to us in verse six. You were there when I killed the lion. You have been there whenever I killed the bear. You were there when I killed Goliath. You've been with me with Saul, wandering after me, Lord Absalom, and all the other stuff of life. You know all about these situations in my life. I am trusting some way, somehow, that you have a future beyond what I see today, that you have a plan bigger than I understand, that you're God even when I don't know where God is, that in this I will still trust you in the dark mystery, unsolved mystery, unsolved mystery of my life. God, I need you to bring your peace to me. Lisa Turkhurst, Christian author, speaker, great lady, was faithful to her husband though he had many affairs. She tried to work out the marriage, but he had more affairs. So she finally said enough. She talks openly and freely about that and about life in general when she speaks. Hopefully we can get her here sometime. She's a gifted communicator. She said, in hard seasons, I've asked God many why questions. Like, why me? And why didn't I get the answer to my prayer I so desperately wanted? Why? Why is this even happening? It's so tempting to wallow in the why, she writes. And asking why is perfectly normal and asking why isn't unspiritual. I interject here, Jesus said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus asked that. But if asking why pushes us further from God rather than drawing us closer to him, then it might be the wrong question. I've decided to ask questions that help me move toward God instead of feeling stuck in some thing that's happened. Starting my questions with what instead of why has been helping me trust God more completely. There are three what questions, she says, that I ask God now. The three what questions are these. Number one, what is a good thing I've learned from this? Number two, what are some lingering negative feelings about this situation that I need to pray through? Number three, what has God been asking me to do today to make tomorrow easier? I know it isn't easy, she says, but switching from why to what paves the way for my mind to find a much better parking spot. (laughs) I like that. I can go with that. Now, do you have an unsolved mystery? Can you trust the God you cannot see with something that you don't know? Can you let him handle it? Can you let him keep it? Can you let him have it? Uh, Laura Marie Kirk, she's still back at Chick-fil-A. They're closed on Sunday, so let's help her get out. She continues, and I just keep thinking, if God is near, I can do this, cancer. I can do this, MS, altering my treatments. If God is near me, I can do it. But if God is far away, it's too much on my own. Today, he feels far away. So I sing, I cry, and I look at the word, the Bible, 
He says things like this. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears them and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. It says he's near to the brokenhearted. Today I qualify as brokenhearted. So I will believe he is near. When I am afraid, I'll put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? You have kept count of my tossing. My tears are in your bottle. Are they not in your book? For you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling. That I may walk before the Lord in the light of life. Psalm 56. Hmm. She continues. I believe these words in my bones. So I will sing them over my heart tonight until it believes them too. I would drop my mic, but I'm wearing it. <laughs> Ken ever text me between services. Said, Pastor, I've just been living through my season, and I'll tell you, God's real. <laughs> this works. God can be with us when things don't go our way, when our loved ones do die, when our loved one walks away from us, when our job dissolves, when our health fades, when we don't understand the mysteries unsolved. Mysteries. Mysteries. 